Welcome back to another Q&A. Today we're going to go over a couple of questions. The first one is coming from a comment that was given in a video I did a couple of weeks ago on methylene blue. In that video we were talking about making sure that when you, when you get methylene blue that you get a good source um, coming from a compounding pharmacy and that when you buy it online and bulk like from Amazon for instance, you're not, you can't be guaranteed that you're getting a safe product. One of the comments asked about the fact that some of these particular uh, methylene blue formulations actually say that they're pharmaceutical grade. So I would still caution in that particular instance, I would still caution against it because pharmaceutical grade doesn't necessarily mean that it's quality tested, that it doesn't have contaminants in it. Um, and and it's, it's again, just kind of one of those things where yeah, maybe you'll be fine. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but it, and, and probably the vast majority of people would be. I, I just don't know, to be honest. Um, when I think about prescribing medications for patients, the first thing I think about is patient safety. Then I also think about, of course, the efficacy, making sure that it's gonna be something that's gonna be effective. And then thirdly, we think about the cost. And so, that's a very, um, a very important one, and that was one of the reasons why this per particular person was asking about this, is the fact that it can still be kind of expensive even through compounding pharmacies. But the, I, I, one of the things that I was told years ago, and I've always remembered that the most expensive medication that you can get is the one that doesn't work or the one that hurts you, um, regardless of the cost. So. I think the most important thing is number one, it's safe. Number two, it's effective. Number three, then we start looking at the cost. And so it's good to find the best bang for the buck, making sure that it's gonna do what it needs to do. The second question is a little bit different because it kind of goes down a different different line of thinking here, different, different question completely. And this one I had to write down is a little bit longer. And this, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but the question was, how does Lyme disease affect the brain and the body to cause mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression? And can this get better? Do we see these kind of symptoms improve? And then the third part of that question was, uh, are there any Lyme literate counselors in the North Dakota, Minnesota area? So that'll be specific to, to this region that we are in. but. Um, there are throughout the, the United States, it, it might be hard to find because Lyme literate practitioners in general can be kind of tough to find. In, in our area, um, we actually have one in our practice. And so if you're in the Minnesota area, that's my first go-to. And, you know, obviously I, I know this particular counselor quite well. She's great and she knows Lyme. And that's, that's super important to have someone. There's a couple others as well, and I'm happy to give recommendations too. So let's go back to that question, how Lyme affects the brain and the body. I actually gave a presentation on this um, just over two years ago called Inflamed in the Brain. Lyme and Lyme co-infections can cause inflammation within the brain because these bacteria actually target the brain tissue. So instead of trying to just explain it to you um, just off the cuff here, I'm going to go back to the presentation that I gave and I'm going to use some of those slides here today to show you what is uh, what's going on there. You know, we, of course, there's a lot of things that we still don't have a complete full understanding of, but we do know some things. There's been some research done that can show us a little bit about why this is happening and, and what do we do about it? How do we help that? So let's go to the slides here and I'll just kind of narrate here a little bit. Um, so Firstly, let's talk about neuroinflammation. So that is just general inflammation within the brain or the spinal cord. Um, we know that the inflammation in this area is caused mainly by what we call glial cells, which are microglia and astrocytes. The microglia are the immune modulating cells of the brain and the spinal cord. So this is a visual that I've used. I really like this. Just kind of gives a really clear, um, not quite anatomically correct version of what's going on here. Uh, the, you think of the microglial cell as Pac-Man, um, the, the ghost that he's going after is, is the bacteria, and then all the little 
um, little dots there are the uh, debris that it's eating up. So that's the, the function of the microglial cell is to, is to take care of debris and take care of bacteria and to, and to function as, as an immune modulator. And inflammation is a physiological process that is normal and expected. However, there can be positive aspects and negative aspects of neuroinflammation. This slide is a is kind of an explanation on, on that. And the, the area here that we want to focus on as to why people develop some symptoms is what are some of the negative aspects of neuroinflammation. And a lot of it has to do with, with chronic inflammation as well. So inflammation is a response to injury um, or insult. And, but when that, when that inflammation is something that continues, there can be some issues with that. The repeated stress can cause, um, can cause changes in the brain. And um, these specific changes affect mood, um, cognition, and um, overall health and well-being. So we could go a little bit more into this, but just keep in mind that inflammation, though technically not necessarily a bad thing because it is normal for your body to, to be inflamed when you're injured, it's that chronic inflammation that's mediated by infection in this case that causes the problems that then start to cause issues with, with the brain. So John Hopkins, I, I've mentioned this in, in past videos and, and things too, I, they've got a Lyme Disease Research Center and I really, really like what's coming out of there. Now, um, this particular study that they did, it's called Imaging Glial Acti Activation in Patients with Post-Treatment Lyme Disease Symptoms. So I, I think it's important to remember um, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome or symptoms is the, the official medical term for someone who has chronic symptoms um, from Lyme disease, someone who has been treated for Lyme but still has symptoms. We tend to call it chronic Lyme because that's what we feel this is. And so anytime I look at the word post-treatment Lyme disease, I, I don't get offended by it. I just simply think, okay, this is their way of, of calling it chronic Lyme. They don't have an explanation. They don't maybe not don't agree with chronic infection or whatever the case may be, but essentially they're targeting and looking at the same thing. Um, so what they found in their study is that they believe that the um, the pathology of the um, the uh, basically the changes within the brain can be linked to this overactivity of of the microglia, and in this case, causing inflammation and inflammatory um, signals that that cause symptoms. So. Um, what they did is they had, it was a small study, so it was a pilot study. They had 12 patients. Every single one of these patients had a, a possible or probable or positive history of Lyme. It was based on CDC criteria so that there were no questions as to whether this was a, a true case of Lyme or not. Um, they had all received, I put in quotations there, appropriate treatment because, you know, appropriate treatment is going to vary based on the patient. So they've all been treated at one point or another for Lyme disease but these patients continue to have symptoms. And then they compare these patients with 19, quote, healthy adults. And they did brain MRIs and PET scans that showed some differences, some significant differences. So this is just an image here. Um, the controls on the left side of the, of the screen here are what the brain the brains of the individuals who were considered healthy looked like. Um, any area that's, that's more towards the red color indicates more inflammation. And then of course, if you look at the right side, this was um, what a typical patient with post-treatment Lyme symptoms or, or chronic Lyme looked like. Very clearly, there was a difference in the level of inflammation in these particular particular individuals. So, you know, what is what do what does inflammation in the brain look like? It's believed that this is the mechanism of what causes those psychiatric or mental health symptoms, such as depression, anxiety, panic attack, panic attacks, fear, um, and, and a number of other things, OCD. Uh, cognitive symptoms too, brain fog is, is one of the most common things we hear about with patients with Lyme disease. 
Now, again, there's probably things that we don't know. I mean, there's lots of things that we don't know, being honest here. But that is one thing that we can say for sure. People that have had Lyme disease or have Lyme disease have, in, on average, more inflammation in the brain. And that is what we believe causes these chronic mental health symptoms. So the, the second part of that question was, does it get better? Can, have we seen patients improve? Absolutely. It is one of those symptoms that can be a little bit trickier and take longer to see, but you've got to, um, with diligent effort and, and treatment, it gets better. Um, I think it's really, really important that you treat the, the underlying chronic infection, making sure that you're using medications that can cross the blood brain barrier. And there are, I would say most medications do to some degree or another. There are some that are probably better than others, um, but there are a lot of good ones that do in with Lyme disease. And then, um, yeah, and then the other thing is, is in treating the inflammation. So it's really important not only to treat the infection, but you got to treat the inflammation, you got to treat the immune function. Talked about that in the last video a little bit more. Um, one particular case study is uh, about an individual who one of the main symptoms they were having was anxiety and panic attacks. And this was in an individual. In a, in a younger individual who um, was in, at the time, elementary and middle school. And so they found that with treating Lyme disease and with treating the inflammation, and in this case they were using PEMF therapy or pulse electromagnetic field therapy uh, to treat the inflammation, they found that this was really beneficial for them in reducing the symptoms. And so the, the short answer to the question is yes, it gets better. It can get better, and we have seen that. Um, but it does take diligent effort treating all the problems that are there and then also addressing the inflammation as well. And I think I asked that, answered that last question the first here, the Lyme Literate Counselors in, in North Dakota, Minnesota area. Um, yeah, we, we have one here, and I know of others, and so I'm happy to, to um, give you some information on that if you... If you want to know more, please leave a comment. I'm happy to give that information to you. Um, and if you have questions about what we talked about here today, again, comment on that. Please leave it in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer those questions. If you have any other questions at all, please um, also leave those questions here on, on YouTube or on Facebook. And be glad to address those questions in, in future videos. Um, we, we do our best to, to answer all the questions that come to us here. So. Uh, I hope this was helpful for you today, and uh, if there's any way that we can help you going forward, just let us know, and uh, wishing you the best of health here today.